So while you're opening up to Exodus chapter 20, I want to start off this morning um, by a little exercise, you know, a little activity. We're going to do it together. I'm going to list off some people, and I want you to pay attention to this list and to pay attention to the first things that come into your mind when I say their names, okay? So you understand what you're supposed to do? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list off some people, and we're going to do some word association, right? The first things that come into your mind, I just want you to sort of file those away, okay? Here we go. Osama bin Laden. September 11th. Rosa Parks. Neil Armstrong. Christopher Columbus. Martin Luther King Jr. Adolf Hitler. George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, Barack Obama, Jonathan Tite, Jesus Christ. Now, the point of this whole little exercise here is to show you that there's, there's much more to a name than the simple sounds that make up the word, right? When I said those names, your mind likely went to either events or just sort of a, a certain fact about them or just a general feeling about them, right? When I said Osama bin Laden, thank you very much, Brian, the very first thing that I think of is 9-11. Maybe the, maybe the first thing I think of is uh, the Navy SEAL raid on his compound to get him. Maybe that's kind of what I think about. But those things come to mind, right? When I said Neil Armstrong, many of you probably first thought, you know, uh, small step for man, giant leap for mankind, first man on the moon, right? When I said Christopher Columbus, many of you thought in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. At least that's what I think, right? All of those names, they have attachments in our minds, right? Some of those people that I listed have a great name, right? They have a, a good name. When I mention their names, you have good thoughts, right? They have a good legacy, um, like, for instance, when I said my name, I know that all of you thought the, the, the smartest and the most handsome man in the world, right? That's what Katie thought. What, what? Most humble. most humble, too. Yeah, that's right. Yep. That's what my wife thought, at least, right? Names carry with them associations and reputations. So, kids, here's one for you, right? If I said that your dad is like Superman, right, what does that mean? It means that he's strong, right? And he's heroic. He's invincible, right? So when I say Superman, you think of a certain kind of person. Now, in today's sermon, we're going to talk about God's name. And just like all of those other names, there's more to God's name than you might expect, and there's more to the third commandment than you might expect. So hopefully you're now all with me in Exodus chapter 20. Uh, please stand to your feet in honor and reverence of God's Word. Uh, we're just going to be talking about the third commandment today, which is verse 7, but we'll read all 10, starting in verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who's within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. 
You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that it is your neighbor's. Amen. Thanks be unto God for his word. You may be seated. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask for the blessing of understanding this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you know that I need your grace to complete this sermon. Lord, I need your grace to explain your word to your people, and they need your grace to understand your word. And so, Lord, we pray that by your spirit you would do a mighty work, that you would impress upon us the weight and the glory and majesty of your name and the privileges associated with bearing it. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Now, as we've been working through the Ten Commandments, one of the um, principles or the sort of guidelines that we've been using is, is this. Every prohibition in the Ten Commandments implies uh, a corresponding duty or responsibility. So, every time we see a prohibition, right, uh, a, a don't do something, we're supposed to understand that there's something else that we're supposed to be doing, that doing that other thing would get in the way of us doing, right? So if someone tells you not to procrastinate, right, what they mean is you're not to delay the things that you're supposed to be doing right now, right? You're supposed to do that work now ahead of time instead of at the last minute. So every time there's a do not, right, in the Ten Commandments, there's an implied do this, okay? Now in the First Commandment, the Lord forbids us from having other gods because, so that's, that's the do not, we're not supposed to have other gods because we're supposed to have the Lord our God only as our God. And in the second commandment, the do not is do not make a graven image. God does not want to be worshipped through images of him, or he doesn't want us to worship images of any other god. So that's how God does not want to be worshipped. Don't make graven images. Instead, what God wants us to do is he wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth according to his word. So the do is worship God according to his word. The do not is don't make images. Now, we come, when we come to the third commandment, we're going to find something else that's forbidden, and there's a corresponding duty. So I'm going to reread it to refresh your memory. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For, here's the reason for the commandment, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So, the thing that's, committed, that's forbidden is taking the Lord's name in vain. Now, that word there, take, you could translate it as to take up or to bear upon, right? So, we're not to take up or bear or carry the Lord's name for vanity. What's a vanity, right? When we see that word vanity, we're not supposed to think of vanity like uh, someone who's obsessed with their appearance. Instead, we're supposed to think about vanity in the sense of this. I could stand up here and flap my arms all day long, but I'm never going to fly, right? All of this flapping is in vain, right? Because I can't fly, right? Vanity in this sense would be something that is worthless, something that's unproductive. So we're not supposed to carry or take upon ourselves or bear the Lord's name for a worthless or an unproductive purpose, something that is done for no good, something that's empty of character, something that's hollow. We're not supposed to bear the Lord's name for something that's wicked. Right? The Lord's point is that he is not to be evoked for evil intentions, for worthless purposes, for pointless purposes. That's what he means. Now, this brings up the corresponding duty, right? So that's the don't. Don't use my name for worthless purposes. The corresponding duty is to use my name for purposes that are worthy. 
What's, what's a worthy purpose? How does the Lord want for his name to be used? Whatever has God's name on it or in it or is a name by which we refer to God is to be used for holy and righteous purposes. He wants his name to be revered. He wants his name to be glorified, to be praised, to be called upon in the day of trouble. What's the first petition or request in the Lord's Prayer? Hallowed be thy name. That's a prayer that the Lord would glorify, magnify, make holy and distinct his name. Psalm 115, verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and faithfulness. Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations and his marvelous works among all the peoples. Joel 2.32. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So that's what the Lord wants us to do with his name. To use God's name for any other purpose, you know, any purpose other than praising him and revering him and honoring him and obeying him. To use God's name for any other purpose other than that is to use it for vanity. A worthless purpose, a thing that is not worthy it's to take his name in vain. And now, speaking of God's name, right, we need to make sure that we're clear about what God means by his name. Now, remember the illustration I gave you earlier. Names aren't just titles. Names evoke a person's character or his reputation or his deeds. So when someone goes out and makes a name for themselves, what are they doing? They're building a reputation. They're building their notoriety. They're building their fame. We see this in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 13 about David. And David made a name for himself when he returned from striking down 18,000 Edomites. It's quite a name. He's a mighty warrior. He's a mighty leader of men, a, a mighty uh, a battle commander. That was the name that David made for himself. So, I'm kind of belaboring the point here, but a name is much more than a collection of sounds. It represents more than that. A name is a summary of a person's whole being or character. And this kind of helps to explain some of the strange ways that we see the word name referring to God used in the scriptures. I'm really grateful that in God's providence, he led the Lord uh, to, he, sorry, he led Danny uh, to preach from Exodus 33 and 34 last week, because he really set me up perfectly for this sermon. Remember, Moses asks for a glimpse of God's glory, and God says, no, 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 you can't see that, but I'll let you hear it, right? Listen to this, Exodus 34, 5 through 7. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. So what, what's he going to proclaim? His name. Let's keep reading. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed. Okay, so everything that's about to come after that is God's name. Okay? The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So what's going on here, right? When the Lord says his name, Yahweh, right? That's not it. The Lord's name is not just the sounds that we use to talk about him, right? Derek. What does Derek mean? It's just a bunch of sounds, unless we know Derek, right? I can, I can pick, I'm just, I'm going to try to, a random name generator in my head. Um, Cletus McGillicuddy, right? I don't know Cletus McGillicuddy, and neither do you, right? I might be able to 
make the sounds of his name. I don't know who he is unless I can tell you something about him. That's also his name. So everything that the Lord said there to Moses is his name. His name consists in his description as a merciful and gracious God. He is, his name is, a merciful and gracious God. That's part of his reputation. His name is that he is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. His name is bound up in his forgiveness and in his justice. So God's attributes, his character, his word, and his actions, all of that can be summarized by a single word, and that is his name. One pastor named Kevin DeYoung says it this way, The way to see God's glory is to hear his name. To, the, to know the name Yahweh, the merciful and gracious one, is not merely to know something about God, it is to know God himself. God shows himself by speaking his name. So what it means to know God is not simply to know the sounds, but to know the content of his character. That's how you know God's name. I really like the way that the Westminster Catechism and the Baptist Catechism explains the third commandment. So, the, it, you know, it's a question and answer format. The question is, what is forbidden in the third commandment? And here's the answer. The third commandment forbiddeth all profaning or abusing of anything whereby God makes himself known. So God's name is anything that he uses to reveal himself to his, to his creatures. Right? So what we're forbidden of is we're forbidden from misusing anything that's a vehicle of God's revelation of himself. The Catechism also asks what's required in the third commandment, and here's the answer. The third commandment requireth the holy and reverent use of God's names, titles, attributes, ordinances, word, and works. Okay, so what sorts of things might we do to take the Lord's name in vain? Let's, let's hit the easy one first, right? The one that everyone's, the obvious one. Outright Verbal blasphemy is a way to take the Lord's name in vain. So whenever we speak of the Lord, he deserves to be spoken of in a way that is true and in a way that is reverent. One of the Puritans, Thomas Watson, he says it like this, When we mention the names of kings, we give them some title of honor, right? like his excellent majesty. And so we should speak of God with the sacred reverence that is due to the infinite majesty of heaven. When we speak of God, we should, the way that we speak his name should correspond to the respect that we owe to his person. Of course, this would forbid using God's names or his titles or his reputation as an expression of anger or frustration. And since all three members of the Trinity are God, this applies to all three members of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have all heard this, or most of us have heard this. Most of us regrettably have done this ourselves, right? We've used God's title, right? God, that's what he is, he's a God. Or, you know, the name of Jesus Christ is a thing to say when we're angry. I, I probably don't need to belabor this point right? These are things that we should not do. I don't think I need to convince you of this. But, you know, just listen to Leviticus 24, 16, and hear how seriously the Lord takes his name. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall be put to death. The congregation shall stone him, the sojourner as well as the native. When he blasphemes the name shall be put to death. So God takes it that seriously. And, I mean, he tells us he takes it seriously in the commandment, right? That's the reason clause. The reason why we shouldn't take the Lord's name is because the Lord's not going to hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Right? And when he says he's not going to hold him guiltless, right, that's an understatement, okay? That's that's a classic way of saying more with less, okay? When he says he's not going to hold him guiltless, what he means is 
There will be terrible judgments for those who profane God's titles, his names, his works, his attributes. Anything whereby he makes himself known should not be profaned by pain or threat of terrible judgment. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't do that. Right? We might not curse God's name in open blasphemy, but we often do use God's names or titles for things that are trivial. Right? Maybe they're not profane, but they're irreverent. What about when we see somebody who's, you know, pathetic or ugly or talk about somebody who's annoying, right? We might say something like, God bless them. Isn't that using the title of the Lord for something that's silly? Or when we're, my, my, we're mildly irritated or mildly impressed, right? We might say something like, oh my God. I'm like, oh, this coffee is delicious. <laughs> right? When, we're do, when we do that, what are we doing? We're taking God's name, we're taking it up, we're bearing it, we're using it for something that's stupid. Coffee? Should we really, should we really compare this coffee to the Lord our God? Should we really invoke his name to describe how good ice cream is? We're using a word that's special, right? It's intended to refer to the Lord our God. And we're speaking it in a way that doesn't really evoke him in our minds. It doesn't really show any reverence or respect to his person. Now, this doesn't mean that we are to never speak the name of the Lord. In fact, we're to speak it often. This doesn't mean that we're never to refer to any of God's titles. There is... A perfectly appropriate time to call out, oh God. Right? I wasn't going to use this analogy, but I think I'm going to do it. Um, you guys who know me know that I, uh, I've seen a lot of 9-11 footage. And um, in the videos, whenever like, one of the planes hit the building or when the they fall, you hear people, ironically, who have been atheists their entire life cry out what? Oh God. Right? I would say that's probably an appropriate use of his name. But, oh my God, your dog is so cute. That's, that's, we should never, we should never do that, right? If your car is veering off the road and you're losing control, it would be appropriate in that split second to cry out, oh God, right? Because that's, that's, a, that's a plea to him for help, right? It's appropriate to call out to God in that situation. So we should only use God's name when we in actually intend to evoke him, and when we do, we should speak of him with reverence and obedience. When I was growing up, we had special plates, and we had special towels, right? And those special plates were not to be used just for regular Thursday dinner, right? Those are for special occasions. Those are for holidays or when we have guests over, right? We've got special towels. They're in the, they're in the, the, the towel cupboard, right? Whatever you call it. Um, they're in the closet, and you don't use those just for, you know, yourself. Those are for guests, right? Or those are to put on display on the pretty racks, and then we have the dirty bleach-stained towels for, you know, the, pl the plebs, right? <clears throat> Right? Just like we have regular words, sorry, just like we have regular, we have regular plates for regular meals, and we have regular towels for regular people, we have regular words for regular things, and we have special words for special things, right? We need to set these words apart as special to refer to the Lord our God and not use them for trash talk or for bywords. All right, so now we've, we've talked about the obvious, but is there, is there anything else in the third commandment? When most people think about the third commandment, they think that when he says take there, he means speak. He doesn't, he doesn't just mean speak, but he means more than speak. I want to show you some other things that the Lord interprets as breaking the third commandment. 
Swearing by God's name falsely breaks the third commandment. Leviticus 19.12 You shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of the Lord your God. I am the Lord. Now the Bible has a lot to say about swearing oaths, and I really don't have time to get into it, but just suffice it to say, the Lord permits us to swear oaths that are solemn and oaths that are serious. Right? And when we do these things, when we do swear an oath, we're to swear it by God's name. Deuteronomy 6.13, it is the Lord your God you shall fear, and him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. So if an oath is absolutely necessary, God wants you to swear by his name. Why do you think that is? It's because God is all-knowing. Nothing is hidden from his sight. He is truth. So to swear by God's name calls God's character and God's omniscience to be a witness to the truthfulness of your statement or, or uh, uh, the solemnity of the agreement that you're making. So it, by that explanation, it should then be obvious why it would, be, it would profane God's name uh, to swear falsely in it. To, to swear falsely by God's name calls God to be a witness and a testifier to a lie. When we swear falsely by God's name, what we're doing is we're making God to be a false witness. But God cannot lie. So what we've done when we swear falsely is we've taken God's righteousness and his truthfulness and his goodness and his character and his omniscience, we've taken that and we have used it for a worthless and evil purpose. We have taken up, we have carried, we have borne his name for vanity. What else breaks the third commandment? Listen to Proverbs 30, verses 8 through 9. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Neither give me poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. So it breaks the third commandment when we forget that God supplies all of our needs. When we act as if we don't need to rely on the Lord our God, we're taking his name in vain. It's the same thing when we steal. When we steal, we're profaning God's name. How's that? How do we get from self-reliance and stealing to profaning God's name? What's the, what's the link between those two things? Well, what we're saying when we pretend we don't need him, we are besmirching his character. We're defaming his reputation. Listen to James 1, 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. So that is part of God's character, right? It's part of God's character. It's part of his name, to be a providing God, to be a giving God, a sustaining God, right? When we act like we don't need him or when we steal things, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're displaying with our actions our mental disbelief in his word. We act as if his words are untrue. We act as if he really isn't what he really says that he is, right? Doesn't Jesus say, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body or what you will put on. Your heavenly Father knows that you need these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So when we steal, we have acted upon our unbelief that God will provide all that we need. Right? We don't believe that, and so we steal. God has revealed himself as a God who provides for the need of his people, and when we steal, we bring dishonor and disrepute upon his name. And really, any time we call into question any of God's words or his attributes, we profane his name. Our God has revealed himself to be a sovereign God in control of all things, and when we say or act as if he's not, we profane his name. We, we profane, we bring, uh, 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 we cast 
We cast darkness upon his reputation. Has God really said? That's what the devil does in the garden. He calls into question God's words. It profanes his name. When we pray and we don't believe that God hears us or will answer, we profane his name. Right? When we pray, we pray in Jesus' name. And if we don't believe that he's able or willing to hear us or answer us, we profane his name. We profane that name. When we doubt that Christ can cleanse us from even the most vile of sins, we call his name into question. Thomas Watson again says, Many ask for pardon, but unbelief whispers that their sins are too great to be forgiven. Thus, to pray and not believe is to take God's name in vain and highly dishonors God as if he were not such a God as the word represents him. For he says he is plenteous in mercy unto all them who call upon him. What else breaks the third commandment? Did you know that sexual immorality breaks the third commandment? Amos 2.7 a man and his father go into the same girl so that my holy name is profaned. Why is that? Why is it an offense against God's name to commit sexual immorality? It's because God's people are sanctified and they're made holy by his name being placed on them. Listen to number 627. So shall the priests put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. So they're to put God's name on the people. Second Chronicles 7, God calls Israel, my people who are called by my name. Now this really isn't hard for us to understand. It's really not. You know how I know? Who's seen the movie Toy Story? I've seen it. How do we know that Woody and Buzz belong to Andy. He writes his name on their foot. Right? Yep, I'm Andy's. Right? That's how they know that they are his. Right? In all of the books of my library, there's a, there, I have a special little embosser, and, it's, and it puts a little mark on the books that says, Library of Jonathan Tite. Right? We put our names on the things that are ours. So, when we want to we tell people, we want to proclaim to people, this is mine, don't take it, right? When you put your lunch in the fridge at work, or when you have your name on your water bottle, you're saying, this is mine, don't take it, it is for me. So, when God wants to put his name on something, to identify something that's his, he puts his name on it. He causes that thing to bear his name, to carry his name. So his reputation and his character are bound up in the things that are his. So when we commit sexual morality, something that has his name on it is being defiled. It brings dishonor and, and ill repute upon God's name. And this helps us to understand something that is interesting in Leviticus 18. And You don't need to turn there. You can just, what I would encourage you to do is just write it down and go and take a look at it. In Leviticus 18, verses 19 through 23, God is giving, he's in the middle of giving them commands about sexual ethics, okay? Right smack dab in the middle of a paragraph, seemingly randomly and arbitrarily, he says this, you shall not give any of your children to offer them to Moloch, and so profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. So right there in this discourse about sexual ethics, he talks about, child sacrifice. Now this tells us a lot of things, but one of the things it tells us is that like our bodies, our children belong to God because he's put his name on them, right? God has put his name on us and God has put his name on our children, and so we're not to profane his name by using our bodies for immorality, and we're not to offer up our little ones who bear God's name to a false god. 
The things that are uniquely God's, that bear his name, these are things that are not to be used for profane purposes. So think about this. In the Old Testament, God had a place where he put his name. Right? First it was the tabernacle, and then it was the temple, and then it was the whole city of Jerusalem. Okay? Those were places for his name. Listen to this about the temple. God says of Solomon in 2 Samuel 7, 3, He shall build a house for my name. Right? So God's house is a place where he makes his name to dwell. And listen to this about Jerusalem. 1 Kings. Rehoboam was 41 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. The city that the Lord had chosen out of all of the tribes of Israel to put his name there. So Jerusalem was uniquely God's city because he wrote his name on it. He put his name there. All right, so get ready. It's mind-blowing, big brain stuff, okay? Guess what Christians are called in the New Testament? They're called the New Temple. And they're called the New Jerusalem. We are houses for God's name. We bear his name on us. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 19. Flee sexual immorality. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? So just like the temple was a place, a house for God's name, so we, the church, are a house for, we bear God's name, right? So the same things that would defile the, the, the temple, which would be sexual morality, they defile us too. In the book of Revelation, the church is the new Jerusalem, the city of God. Listen to, this is from Revelation 22. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Outside the city are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and the murderers and the idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Well, that's interesting. Those things that we might do to profane God's name are the exact same things that are outside of the city the things that defile God's house. These things are not to enter God's city, you know, God's city because his name dwells there. His name is to have no fellowship with evil, with darkness. Now, if you're like me, you're probably thinking, you know, there's, there's a lot more to this commandment than I had first thought. And that's right, there is a lot more. And there's more still. I do want you to turn here. Colossians 3.17 Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. 3.17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now think about that in light of the third commandment. In everything that we do, we are to bear Christ's name. All that we do, we're to do it in his name. There are no exceptions. Everything that we do in our lives either slanders Christ's name or it honors it and it glorifies it. We are to do no evil, nothing that is empty or vain or worthless. Peter Lightheart has this quote, and it's great. Speaking or silent, active or passive, we bear the name all the time and in everything we do. Every sin is a violation of the Lord's holy name, the name he shares with us. So do we feel the weight of the name, or do we treat it as empty breath? It's a question I'd like to put forward to you this morning. This is a vision for all of your life. There's no such thing as neutrality. We can do nothing neutral. We either bring honor to Christ's name or we don't. We either spend our time doing things that God requires and 
permits or we spend it doing the things that he forbids. Right? In everything that we do, we are to be giving thanks to the Father through Christ's name. Either we do it or we don't. So is that the filter that you use to determine your thoughts and your actions? Right? The first question that you should ask whenever you have a decision to make is, will this, will doing this, bring glory to the name of Christ? There's no neutral speech. We're either honoring God as we speak or we aren't. There's no neutral education. We're either educating our children in Christ's name or we're offering up our children to Moloch or to Caesar to be educated in their name. There's no neutral government. We're either writing laws that bring glory to Christ's name or we're defiling Christ's name. We're profaning it. God gets a say in whatever we do because we bear his name. All right, so I know that I just said that all of life is to be lived in God's name, but here are six specific ways that we must honor Christ. So if you're looking for some take-home applications or something to take notes with, this is what you should do. We should glorify Christ's name in our communication about God. That's number one. In our communication about God, when we speak of the Lord our God, we should never refer to his names, right? His titles, his attributes, his ordinances, his words, his works. We should never speak of those things in a flippant, careless, or disrespectful manner. Instead, when we evoke God, we should always do it with reverence. Christians must avoid speaking of God in a way that is not worshipful or does not incite others to worship him. Instead, we should frequently speak about the Lord our God with joy and with praise. We should always tell of his glorious words and works. And this involves frequency in evangelism and regularly informing others about how God has answered our prayers. That is the way that God wants us to speak about his name. He wants us to speak reverently and frequently and to as many people as we can. Now, the second thing, we need to revere Christ's name in our communication to God. Okay? We should pray frequently and reverently. When we pray, we pray in Jesus' name as he has instructed us to do. And when we do pray, we pray in a reverent manner. It, it, it never ceases to get under my skin, and I think rightfully, when I hear people start prayers with something like, Sup, God. Makes, makes my skin crawl. It gives me goosebumps. Christians should never pray for selfish things or to satisfy their lusts. We should never pray for things like fancy cars or jewelry or wealth. Right? God might give us those things, but we, we don't need to ask him for them. And if you don't believe me, James 4.3 you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So when we pray, we must pray in faith. We should not rush through prayer or think that we're going to be heard because of our lengthy prayers or our, you know, verbosity, which is ironically a verbose word, but, right, our eloquence. Number three, we should honor Christ's name in the way that we receive communication from God. We must receive and believe all of God's word. Right? Because God has revealed his name in his word, right? when he reveals his character and his works, his word must be accepted as true. One of the ways that we honor God's name is by knowing and believing his character as he has revealed himself. So this means that God's ability to forgive us in Christ and God's wise providence or direction of the world, that should not be doubted. We'll put some feet on this. If God says that he's in control of the weather, that means that we should not murmur or grumble when rain cancels our zoo trip. 
or when you know the cold uh, kind of ruins our fall break. You know, we shouldn't. Why would we mumble about the weather? God says over and over and over again that he is in control of the weather. So when we grumble about it, we're really kind of grumbling about him. And we're profaning his name, his good and his wise providence over all of the things that he's created. We should especially believe his promises to forgive our sins in Christ. We should run to him for help in our time of need. We should rely on his promises, especially concerning our sanctification and his second coming. That's the third thing. The fourth thing, we need to honor the name of the Lord our God in our obedience to God. What do I mean by that? The Christian life should be a fruitful thing. We should not be worthless or fruitless Christians. We shouldn't bear his name for nothing, right? Instead, we should be producing the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. Christians should be growing in all of these things, endeavoring to do everything that they do in Christ's name. Number five, we need to honor the name of the Lord our God in our words to others. So every word that we speak should be spoken to the glory of God and in Christ's name. And since Christ cannot lie, Christians should never defraud their neighbors. They should never harm their neighbors by lying or withholding the truth. We should never bear a false witness or swear falsely. Christians should keep our commitments and be generally truthful. We should not lie to cover up our guilt if there is any. We should confess our guilt to God and to those we have offended. To do otherwise is to bear his name in vain. And six, finally, we should honor the Lord our God concerning our purity as temples of God. We must use our body and our mind for Christ-honoring purposes. We should never be given over to sexual immorality, to lust, uncontrolled anger or rage, drunkenness, witchcraft, or laziness. God has set his name upon us, and we should always endeavor to preserve an accurate testimony of his character. We are Christians, after all. We bear Christ's name and the very name Christian. So don't be hesitant to take upon yourself the name Christian. I mean, it is biblical. Was it in Athens, the first place? Antioch. Antioch was the first place they were called Christians. In Acts, we read that the apostles counted it a privilege to suffer dishonor for the name of Christ. So don't profane Christ's name by denying him before men, by being ashamed of being what you are, a person with God's name on them. Now, turn with me real quick. I promise we'll be almost, we're almost done. Romans 10. If you are guilty of breaking the third commandment like I am, what do we need to do? We need to repent. Instead of defaming his name, we need to call upon his name in reverence and in obedience for salvation, right? Verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him in, of whom they have never heard? So these verses show us that the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, just the, those sounds, it's worthless without some understanding about him, right? We must know him by believing in his works. That's how we call on his name, right? It's not sufficient to just tell somebody, hey, just, just say Jesus, save me, and you'll be fine. That's, <laughs> that's just like 
an empty ritual, an incantation. You're trying to use God, Jesus' name as a magic spell, which would profane his name, right? To call on Jesus' name is to trust in his work, to trust in his character, to trust in his words. We must trust in his name in order to be saved. In order to do that, right, in order to believe in the one that we call on, we have to know something about him in order to believe it. So, we have to trust that Jesus is who he says that he is, and that he has done what he says he has done. To trust in Jesus' name means to trust in his works. That's what it means to trust in his name. So, unbeliever, if you find yourself in the position of not having received the grace of Christ this morning, you may receive it by calling on Jesus' name. Cry out to him. Trust in his perfect goodness for you. Trust in his obedience as your obedience by proxy. I am trusting in Jesus alone, not in what I can do. I'm not going to try to afflict punishment on myself for sins, right? I don't need to worry about forgiving myself for my sin. I need to worry about forgiveness from God. And I need to trust in Jesus' substitutionary death on my behalf. That's how we believe in his name. So Christian, unbeliever, let's treat Christ's name with the glory and the reverence that it deserves. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I beg your pardon for the times that I have borne your name in vain. I've used your name for worthless speech. I've defiled the thing that has your name on it with a various number of sins. But Lord, not to my name give glory, but to your name. I pray that you would glorify your name in this church of Christians. Lord, may our conduct serve as a worthy testimony to the character of God and our Savior Jesus Christ in our speech, in our thoughts, in all that we do, may we do all in Christ's name. And we pray these things in his name. Amen.